Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I'm here with special guest Ben Maddox of Five Games for Doomsday. How are you doing today, Ben? I'm I'm fine. I mean, you know, I could go into my life story, but you or your listeners have no desire to listen to that. So let's let's leave it at fine. All right, we'll take the the Minnesota. I'm fine. Uh, so do you want to tell us really quick about Five Games for Doomsday, so that people who don't happen to know who you are can find out? I love this. I get to do my plugs up front. This is this is this is great. So, five games for Doomsday. Any relation or similarity it has with flagship BBC Radio Four radio show Desert Island Discs is purely coincidental. But basically, the the podcast is where I get notables from the game design world. I've spoken to Richard Garfield. I've spoken to Rana Canizia. I've spoken to Oh, crikey. Lots of famous gamey people. And the premise is there's been an unknown apocalypse. They're fleeing from the apocalypse and they can only take five of their games with them. And so the games they choose, I use as a springboard to talk about them and their lives and their views and all of that sort of stuff. So that's the podcast. And then I've recently started a YouTube channel, which is in its sort of embryonic forms and is being is being sort of uh, formed as we speak. I'm currently doing my top 50 games. I'm onto the top 10 now. And yeah, uh, my goal is to produce stuff that's interesting, but with an element of craft and writing involved. And also I'm not big on doing marketing, which I think we'll probably get into in this. And uh, yeah, so you can go to fivegamesfordoomsday.com or youtube.com forward slash five games for doomsday. Get on it. Yes. And I will also be putting a link in the show notes. So Ooh, Ben, I actually brought you on today because we are both game reviewers and I just thought it would be fun to talk about our craft. And you are also an artist of another sort. You are an actor and specifically a voice actor. Is that correct? No, I mean, I do everything. How I did you I'm... get into that? Well, you do, you follow the, you follow the things. I think it's a combination of you follow the things you A, like and B, show aptitude as. And I think, I think being good at something is often the main catalyst for you pursuing that thing, right? I think love is wonderful, but ability is, is much stronger. So I was always pretty good at acting. I was always, you know, the lead in the school plays and stuff. And when it got time to choose which university to go to, I decided to apply to drama schools instead of universities. So I went to drama school, finished drama school, got no work, and now... I've I've done a thousand different jobs, but people still occasionally keep hiring me for acting work, which which um, I got hired to do a play for the first time in ages, and then COVID hit. So fingers crossed, the play is happening the beginning of next year. Oh man! So as an actor, uh, I I was only I only acted when I was younger. But what I remember is that in order to be a successful actor, you have to be able to withstand superhuman amounts of rejection and criticism. Has that been the case for you? Well, I certainly wouldn't call myself a successful actor. My CV certainly wouldn't test to that. But yeah, it, I mean, in my early the early part of my career, I think the reason it was so monumentally bad because I just didn't work for years after I left drama school and that's because I took everything I took every rejection so personally it destroyed me for weeks I, I've given up acting 20 times and that's because I was a feather for each wind that blew right I every time someone said no and and they say no a lot it, it just destroyed me as I got older um my my you know, I got a bit more calloused. I realized that not getting work, being rejected as an actor is not necessarily a reflection of your talent. It's a reflection of what the director conceives the part to be. And the beauty of voice work is that you don't have to go to castings. You have a, a set of demos 
and your agent sends out the demos and you get the job and then they call you, which is which is brilliant. Um, because, you know, you go to an audition and then you sit around waiting and inevitably don't get it. But yeah, no, to I wouldn't to be an actor at all is accepting the fact that you won't get a lot of work and accepting the fact that a lot of people you don't respect do better than you too, which is which is just the way of the world, right? Indeed. Indeed. No names mentioned, of course. So <laughs> I have a question. You have dealt with a lot of rejection. And as you have now admitted, you had, you know, it, it hurt on a personal level. And I'm like that too. Yeah. I actually really hate being criticized. And yet we are reviewers who make a hobby out of becoming self-appointed critics for other people's work. How have your own experiences played into your work as a game reviewer? So I'm very much of the view that as soon as you put your work out for public consumption, all bets are off and your feelings are completely inconsequential to the way people should react to your work, right? That being said, I think if you've got a friend who's doing a play and you go and see the play and it's dreadful, face to face don't tell your friend that their play is dreadful go yeah that was great and then avoid talking about it anymore but i think you know i think if you're legitimately criticizing it i think if you're reviewing something your job is to react to to the quality of the thing you're being presented with and the personal feelings of the creator are, are, are totally uh, are totally nothing to do with what the, the work you should come out with. And I I think, you know, I've had people tell me my acting is good and I've had people tell me my acting is bad. And, you know, it's better that they're honest than not, I think. So as a reviewer, what components of a review do you think are worth including for a game? When you're reviewing a game, what are you trying to capture for the people who consume your review? Uh, two things, I think. So one is definitely not the rules. I, I The rules to most games are available online. You can read them. Why you would go to a review to read the rules of a game it completely befuddles me. And, you know, most, most game reviews have, you know, three quarters of the game explaining the rules and then a quarter of opinion. I think that's completely the wrong way around. And I, I think giving an overview, a brief overview of the game is fine, but any more than, if you're writing a review and it's 1,500 words, any more than 200 words on that is a complete waste of time. I, I want to do two things. I want to open up sort of what the game does, which parts of the brain it tickles, which parts of the body it tickles. Does it create an atmosphere around the table? And if so, what it is that atmosphere? And then secondly, I want to say, is the game good or not? And I see a lot of people talking about, you should say, well, this is a game that's for me. I mean, it's implicit, I think, that if I'm putting opinions out there, that they're my opinions. I don't think that needs to be stated. I don't think you need to say, oh, in my opinion, the game is like this. That's not the view of a critic. The view of a critic is, is to say this is good or bad. You should then show your working. It's not good enough to just say, oh, well, this game's rubbish. Then you need to explain why the game is rubbish or why the game is amazing. But, you know, all of this... This is just my opinion, I think is completely facile and unnecessary. Clearly, it's your opinion. You've written the review, right? Fair enough. I also, I mean, I, if it's a game I really like, I might actually provide warnings of, you know, if you are this style of gamer, you might not be as enthusiastic as I am. And I'm a teacher, so I do a little bit of the criticism sandwich. Like, if you look at my Dice Tower reviews, I watched a couple of my old ones and had a big laugh about this. You know, I'll be like, well, there are many things to appreciate about this game. However... <laughs> <laughs> and so I'll look for I'll look for something nice to say and then I'll just like unload politely. Look, I mean, some things most things, in fact, sort of have good elements and bad elements, right? But some things are just dreadful. The whole idea that you should find something positive. If there's nothing positive to be said, you should be honest. The whole goal of a review is honesty, above all. That should be the credo. 
And so if the game is a disaster, then it's a disaster. Right? On that, we agree. Do you think that it matters the kind of tone that you use to deliver your criticism? However, I've noticed in my reviews that I'm a bit restrained. Like I've never done a huge total dump on a game, in my opinion. You, it might hurt you if you're the person who designed it, but I keep my words as polite as possible. Is that a philosophy that you hold to as well or no way? Absolutely not. No, I um, I wrote a review of Seafall and I can't remember the exact quote, but I think I described it as testicle shrinkingly bad. And <clears throat> I, I don't know, is, am I allowed to say the word testicle in this show? It's my show, yeah. Good, yeah. And so, you know, I... <laughs> The point is, and I, I, I reviewed another game as well, and it was just clear the game hadn't been playtested or not playtested enough because I played it and the same problems happened again and again and again. And so basically the whole structure of my review was do your bloody job before you release the game to the public because, you know, making something good. And then we all mess up for sure, but I think you know, that should be pointed out. And as I say, you know, the minute it gets, the minute it gets released to the public, then you don't have a say at how people react. And the thing is my, it's about duty, right? Who is your duty to? My duty when I review a game is not to the publisher. My duty is to the people who will consume this review. And if I pull my punches, and if I'm nice for fear that the publisher will stop giving me free games, or I'm going to hurt the feelings of the, I'm going to hurt the feelings of the artist. Well, then the people who consume my work might not get the accurate impression, and my duty is absolutely primarily to them because what reviews are are a call to restraint. Reviews are there to help people not buy games. They're not there to help people buy games because what reviews certainly can't be, and a lot are in this sphere, I think, is marketing. Yeah, I myself have a lot of ethical qualms about my work. I mean, it's it's hard in a field where everybody's friends, where I'm friends with designers and friends with publishers and friends with other media. You know, I have to make sure you know, I'll warn people if I don't like your game, just, you know, I love you, but you know, it's, it's not going to go <laughs> great right. because I think, I think we live in a community where, you know, even looking at all the Facebook groups and stuff, I love being part of the game community. We're a really fun culture to be part of, but it's also a very consumeristic Sometimes. culture. <laughs> where you know people want to be convinced to buy things and i kind of feel yeah, like yeah sure. the job of a reviewer is to maybe give you some reasons not to buy something for sure for sure you know because because game publishers and all of this they have people who do the marketing for them they they already exist let them do their job if you're a reviewer do your job which is to say maybe don't buy this one because it ain't very good Right. So so this whole idea, what, what really amazes me is you, you, you'll see these threads come up in Facebook groups saying, oh, my God, these reviewers, they just write negative reviews because it makes them seem edgy. And that's just I mean, maybe there are some that do, but that's not true. The point is you write a negative review if the game is bad. You write a positive review if the game is good. You know, um, I, I the, the whole goal is honesty. And the thing with me is is I'm probably more likely to write a positive review because I love games, right? So I'm going to be, I, I'm going to enjoy playing the game. So I'm much more likely to write a positive review than I am a negative review because I'm a gamer. But that's the only bias I bring in. There is, you, you can't think, you can't think about hurting people's feelings and you can't, and I think this is the one thing you cannot worry about publishers not giving you free games if you write a negative review. Because sure, that will happen. Publishers will say, well, you trashed our game. You're not getting anything else from us. But you can't be into reviewing for free games, right? Right. I mean, that's distinctly not the point. Especially, actually, my number one thing that I hate seeing is when people imply that a review copy is payment for a review. That is right. extremely not my viewpoint. Uh, you know, no. any other group of media, you don't you don't send your book to the New York Times Book Review and say, oh, well, I paid you for that review by sending you my book. Right. 
It's not a gift. It's actually work. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. And 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 the thing is, you know, I I think there is the thing is most people in it are are amateurs. What's really interesting is I was interviewing Tom Vassell the other day, and I I think about I think about him a lot when it comes to these kind of discussions. Because when he started reviewing games, I think there was no question that you're just honest about the stuff, right? There was none of this conflict of interest stuff because no one was making any money. And so, you know, sometimes people will say, oh, Tom Vassell's paid by Fantasy Flight or whatever. And it's clearly not true. He is... Whatever you think of Tom's work, I mean, there's no question he is honest when he reviews games, right? And that is the the base level on which you operate. Any so so I, I watched a brilliant video the other day. It was from a guy who's a board game publisher. But he'd been working in media before. So he did this YouTube video which was to new YouTubers. And sort of he he explained sort of how to set up a shot and the rule of thirds and all of this sort of stuff. And really valuable information. And then he came on and he said, oh, but my final point for board game reviewers is, you know, talking about the content of your reviews. And of course, then alarm bells start going off because he's a board game publisher, right? And he said, maybe don't be so harsh to games. And he said, maybe, you know, if you think a game is bad, maybe don't say the game is bad. Say, this isn't the kind of game for me. And I thought, well, they're two completely different points right? You can recognize the good in something without actually liking it yourself. And I, I think this is the problem because we're amateurs, so much of us, there is such a bleed over between the people who create the games and the people who comment on the games that this guy absolutely didn't see at any point any conflict of interest with a board game publisher telling reviewers how to write their reviews. And that blows my mind. Right. You know, I actually get most of my review advice from my parents who are both journalists. And so right. they've been in trouble with politicians and local companies and, you know, anyone that they write a negative story about. So, you know, I was always raised that if you're media, the goal is to tell the truth, even if people get mad. And if people do get mad at you, then maybe you're actually doing your job. And so right. that particular inclination you know, I'm polite about it, but I also don't mince words. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. A, I saw a who will remain unnamed game designer on Facebook the other day put this post out saying, this person has just released this horrible review of my game. I can't bloody believe it. It's so unfair. And da 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 right? And so he made this post. And then about an hour later, he he wrote back and said, hey... Sorry about the previous post. I was just pissed off after watching the review. Of course, anyone's entitled to their opinion. And 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 I I was really refreshed by that because the point is, right, if you put all of your time and effort into something and someone trashes it, it's going to disappoint you. I mean, I I wouldn't go to go to Facebook or Twitter to moan about it, but what was what was heartening was the realization that once the passion had calmed down that hey the person just doing their job like i was and that's what the job is right yeah although i actually like the language that you're using for where i would like to push this conversation so we talked about this as a job most reviewers both including both of us we're amateurs we do this because it's our hobby and because we get a kick out of doing it i get yeah. small amounts of money from my youtube channel you know i get some money per video from the dice tower, but we're not talking to living here. You know, this right. is something that is a fun thing that helps me buy more games, <laughs> but right. you know, the, the, where the money is moving in board games, you know, we don't have a newspaper that reviews board games and hires a bunch of us. We don't have, right. you know, most of the money that moves is moving from the publisher. And, you know, we have a very consumeristic culture as we've mentioned before. And I, wonder how that impacts not only games criticism but also you know ultimately the artistry of the games that come out and what sense are board games art and in what sense are they a product you know my favorite review of yours is caca alarm where you rail <laughs> against the consumeristic tendencies of thinking it's funny to buy a wasteful plastic toilet that shoots rubber turds 
It's just such a bloody waste of time. The world is on fire. <laughs> Australia at the beginning of the year was on fire for four months and we're making plastic toilets with turds that fly out of it. I mean, my God, it really is Nero standing on the battlements playing the fiddle as Rome burns. It, it blows my mind. Anyway, carry on. Yeah, so I guess what I'm asking is, you know, you also are an artist in your regular life. How do board games present to you as art? And how do they present to you as objects? And, you know, do you have thoughts on that? Well, everything is everything, right? Without wanting to sound suitably vague. So I think I think we have a romanticized notion of art being somehow disconnected from the grubby world of money. And this was true when most art was being created by aristocrats in the 18th and 19th century, and they weren't doing it for money. But that ain't the case. You know, art is a way of making a living. And so, of course, current trends, current ideas about what is good and what is bad is going to affect art. Art is not pure. Art is art is a commodity to be sold. That's not to say you should directly create something purely for for the money of it. You should also think it's good. I believe in that. But it's it's interesting because I think board games so I was having a, a chat with a friend of mine about this the other day, and we were talking about to what degree are they art. And I think they definitely are, and some skirt closer to that than not. But I think every medium has a particular way of evoking human emotion, about telling you about who we are as an animal. And, you know, in some ways the human language is really bad for talking about art. So what does music make you feel? What is the artistic impact of music? Well, you can try and write about it, but it never really fully encompasses what listening to a piece of music that makes you feel grounded to the planet actually does to you. It's very difficult. Words fail in the way that music creates its art. And I think games are similar. Games create a way of connecting us to other people, connecting us to ourselves, connecting us to the planet that is specifically born out of the interaction of game mechanics, that is specifically something that is given to games. This is why I often find that when the narrative device of games is pages and pages of poorly rendered flavor text that it doesn't quite work and that's because it's not utilizing the tools that games offer to people to create their art from does that make sense actually yeah it makes a lot of sense and i also wonder does does judging a game by that standard you know does this create using its rules, a certain kind of atmosphere, a way of thinking that's worth something. Is that, do you think, a valid way to judge the value of a game for society? Well, it's how I judge it. I, how valuable that is, is is difficult to say, right? But I guess, I mean, my my general idea when I'm reviewing a game is, is it good? And that seems tremendously reductive, but of course within that is, does it fulfill the notions of a game? In the sense, do the mechanics work well together? Can I get through the game without the game breaking down? Does it seem incredibly biased to one particular kind of strategy? Is it fundamentally interesting? Are the choices painful? Which is, I think, a huge crux in games, you know. That wonderful thing in Euro games where you get to the end of the game and you think, ah, I just don't quite have enough time to do everything that I want. It it, is such a wonderful aspect. To games and you know do so there's that element does the game feel good in my hands does it make nice noises does it look good that is also part of it because games are 3d tactile objects does the game and then does the game relate to something within the world does it tell a serious story about serious events does it Does the interaction of the mechanics reflect some sort of aspect of what it is to be human? I I wrote in my top 10 list, I I was talking about no thanks, and I 
was talking about how no thanks was a great analog for the way we travel through life in that life is a decision it is a, is just a long succession of binary choices do i go left or right do i go backwards or forwards do i say yes do i say no and that and from those very simple decisions a whole tree of life grows right and no thanks is that do i take a card or do I not take a card? And what are the ramifications of that decision? And I think, I can't even remember what the original question was, but that's that's how I think about reviewing games personally. If you want to go from the angle of, is, of, do you think this is a valid commercial product that will sell? I think that's perfectly fine too, if that's your angle. Or, you know, does this appeal to as wide a group of people as possible? If that's your angle, then that's great. Or does this appeal to a specific niche perfectly? If that's your angle, that's great too. I just go for the slightly more pretentious one. Yeah, I felt like I would ask you this question just because I worry that my own analysis of games can be a bit pretentious. I really liked hearing what you had to say about No Thanks, right? Because it's such a simple game. And my tastes over the last few years have really tended towards heavy games in some ways because I feel like there's more to say about them. Um, games that are trying to model history or trying to represent something that I can actually get my hands on or that, you know, really reflect a key moment in humanity. You know, for me, I almost find those kinds of games easier to review because I almost feel for like sure. there's more to say. And I wonder if that unfairly prejudices me against light games at times. Look, I mean, we all have our biases, right? None of us, we all are inclined towards certain things. I mean, the way I, the way I approach a review of something is by saying, I really liked this. Why? Right? And then from there, you try and dissect what it is about those games. Why do I love No Thanks? Because I love it. I absolutely love it. And it's it's many, many aspects. That one I mentioned is just one aspect of it. The way it, you know, promotes hilarity around the table, the way it's truly an experience, the way it's the game equivalent of Pringles, because you can't just play it once. You have to play it five times a night. It is you know, and I, I think this is why I think I fundamentally object to the idea of you shouldn't do negative reviews is because people say, well, the problem with negative reviews is that I have to play this game I don't like a lot of times to then produce something on it. And and, and I think my fundamental issue with that is that the prize for having to play that awful game five times that you don't like is the piece of work that comes out at the end the way that you're able to unravel the puzzle of why i didn't like this and what people fail to realize when they talk about negative and positive reviews the puzzle of why i hated this is the exact same puzzle of why i loved this and the prize is unraveling that puzzle is is putting that into coherent thoughts that others can then understand and agree with or disagree with and promote conversation because I think everything we do is a form of reaching out to the other animals in our species and having a piece of work that people can react to that can commend you on or condemn you on is the prize that's why bad reviews are just as good as good reviews for the person creating them you know what? I actually agree with that. I will play a game that I don't like multiple times just for the sake of creating a good review. Um, as much as people th say, you know, well, artists create and critics criticize. I actually think that there is a lot of art to boiling down your thoughts about a game. It requires a lot of precision. It requires a lot of reflection to be able to coherently present your opinion, good or bad, for about a game. And there's value in that. For sure, but, and I'll always say this, and please don't take offense, critics should never get above themselves and think that they are in any way occupying the same noble level as the people who create. The people who create are the ones at the top. The people who create are the ones that should gain the admiration. The critics are, you know, the barnacles that attach to the ship. Any great review, even if it's beautifully written, is a lesser form, 
than a created art form. The creators are the the creators are the are the paragons. And this is why if creators are falling below a certain standard, the job of the critic is to slap them around the face and say, do better. You know, I actually do not disagree with that at all. Um, I'm a historian by trade, right? And I, I put a lot of value on historical work. In some ways, I think that game analysis in an academic level is something that's an important contribution to the conversation, but you can't do that work without the raw material to work with. And, of course. you know, I also think that my job as a reviewer is to show enthusiasm for the things that I think are amazing. And if you're saying that everything's great, how do people know when you really mean it? Um, you know, if I'm giving the game nine or 10 stars, I'm really telling you it's good because not everybody gets that kind of love. I mean, the, I think the reason, <laughs> and this might just be arrogance. I don't, I, I stopped putting a rating on my reviews. I stopped putting stars in. And I think the main reason was is because people won't read the review or listen to the review then. They'll just uh, skip to the bit where there's stars and say, oh, okay, fine. Um, because I think, I think the act of criticizing something should be you, you should be able to know why someone has come to the star rating because I do it myself I see a review of something and then I, I just flip and see if it's four or five stars and then I might read the review based on it so that, that's why I remove because I, I want people to read what I've written you know even if it is yeah you know I because I'm a reviewer for Dice Tower we have to give ratings it's just part of right. the part of the job. So my rating is out there and I just kind of accept it, but I actually don't disagree. And in some ways I find that it's just like grades. You know, I'm a teacher. I hate giving grades because they don't really mean anything. They don't. I right. mean, was your work good? Well, you were showing this strength in your work. You were showing this weakness in your work. If you want to improve, you can do this. You should be really proud of that. You know, all of those comments should mean so much more than the score. And we don't really have room for that in our current culture. No, until we get UBI, we we just don't have room for education for education's sake, right? Edu like it or not, education is not about the enrichment of the mind. It's not about creating citizens of the world. It's about getting someone ready for the workplace. And that's why grades are important because a HR, an overworked HR person looking through a thousand CVs can go, oh, okay, they got below this grade. They can instantly get thrown away, right? That's the problem. That's why we need, that's why we need something like UBI because then people can actually learn for the sake of learning, not just to get a job. That's nothing to do with games. And I think in some ways it does have a lot to do with games, though, because, okay, uh, as an educator, it pains me so much that people don't want to do things for the sake of doing them. I'm a Latin teacher. I got a PhD in ancient Christianity. I have never done a practical right. thing in my life. And you know what? I am better for it. <laughs> and, and I also feel that, you know, play. When, when I first started my blog and people were reading it, you know, about board games. I got excited. I was like, oh my gosh, more than two people read it this week. And the colleague who I had made that remark to was like, why don't you write about something important? And I think it's so important to value play and making sure that the experiences that you have for yourself are valuable that, you know, and for me as a reviewer, you know, I probably get more out of my reviews than anybody else does because it's the act of, of thinking about what I did and reflecting and, you know, taking that knowledge to the oh, next Oh yeah, thing. no question. And, you know, these things are done for their own sake, but man, you know, what a lot they do for you as a person. And I, I, I think it's a real shame to boil everything down to a number, to boil everything down to a bottom line, when the experience is the part that matters the most. It's just the part that you can't quantify. Right. And and, and the point is, I, and, and this is why I think, this is why I think actually when people moan about negative reviews and people moan about politics in games and all of this sort of stuff, actually what I think they're moaning about is I go to this place for eight hours a day and do something, and if I barely like it, that's great, but most of the time I don't want to be there. Then I come home and I do this thing, and this thing is where I get my actual joy. This thing is where I get my, my respite from the horrible pressure 
of being a human being on the planet. And now you come in and you say bad things about this thing I like, or you say political things about this thing I like. I don't want to argue with you because I want this to be a place of joy. And I think that's where people come from when they get angry about those sorts of things. But still, you know, I'm a believer that games are art and they need to be treated seriously and they need people to treat them seriously. And so sometimes you're going to say nasty things and you're, you know, that that's it. Yeah, I think for me that leads to the point that just there is no such thing as a game that is just a game. Every single game is a reflection of our culture, which is why it's important to talk about politics and how we relate to other people. Because every single game, right. whether we understand it ourselves that way or not, says something about us, says something about what we value. It says something about how we live or feel that we should live. And, you know, there's just never an easy answer for anything. There's no such thing as just a simple anything. That's why human relationships are so hard. It's why marriages don't always last. You know, like, nobody could just go home and not have any obligations or ties or anything to anybody right. else. And being real about how you feel is like the best way to handle that for me, <laughs> even if it's bad. And hey, you know, there's no people can moan about negative reviews all they want, but there's no there's no um, compulsion upon them. If if you find you have there's a reviewer who who you know, you don't like, you don't like their style or your st- or their style makes you unhappy or brings a, a level of something into their criticism that you don't want to deal with. Well, there's no compulsion to consume it, right? Just just don't. That's- yeah, that also leads to the next thing, right? If you don't like it, you don't have to play it. You don't have to read it. You don't have to watch it. Maybe you're a hate right. watcher and you're getting some sort of perverse pleasure out of consuming things you don't like, which that is a perfectly respectful way to spend your time. That's fine. But- <laughs> For sure. But... Yeah, I mean, there's also just the matter of choice. I think my favorite YouTube comments that I get are ones that ask me to change the entire substance of what I do or the things that I talk about because it's like, uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, I I got a co- I got a comment on my last video, and I'm I'm learning this stuff. I mean, I I'm I'm hopelessly I'm hopelessly useless at this sort of thing, and. I have this in my YouTube videos. I have candles on one side of the thing, and I put the picture of the games in front of the candles, and someone wrote. Why have you got the picture of the games in front of the bloody candles? And it was like a a ray of light came out of the clouds. And I went, yeah, why have I? That makes no sense at all. So, you know, who knows? People criticizing your work can sometimes be helpful, I guess. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've gotten great comments that really changed the things that I did. And I also got comments that I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. And I think that, you know, what we're doing is not as artistically valuable as making the product itself. You know, we're essentially hangers on of these people who make things for us to interact with. Absolutely. But, you know, the work that we do is also subject to criticism and that's fine. For sure. (laughs) And it doesn't mean just because, just because you're not the artist, just because you're the one commenting on the art. Um, what's, what's the, um, what's the, what's the, uh, policy on swearing on this podcast? Uh, I am a member of no networks, and go for it. We're far okay. enough in that YouTube won't care. I, re- <laughs> I remember that one of my acting teachers, and this is a terrible joke, by the way, and it's not terrible in the fact that it's a bad pun. It's just not funny. But one of my acting teachers told us a joke. And it, it's one that's always stuck with me. So this critic, he dies and he goes to heaven. And uh, he goes to the gates of heaven. There's there's St. Peter stood there. And St. Peter says, okay, so what did you do in life? And the critic goes, well, I was a critic. And, and Peter goes, I, I, sorry, I, I don't understand what that means. And he says, well, you know, people do stuff. People create stuff. And then I criticize it. And St. Peter turns around to the critic and says, well, you can fuck off then. <laughs> and... It's not a funny joke, but I think really encapsulates the notion of what a critic is, right? But at the same time, that doesn't mean you shouldn't aspire to be good within that work. You should aspire to... I I mean, I think of... uh, uh, Well, my sort of writing on games is, is twofold. Firstly, it's to satisfy myself, because everything is fundamentally. But then secondly, it is the goal of serving the people who read my reviews and my absolute obligation is to them that's why uh 
that's why I, I sometimes get a little disheartened when I go onto the board game reviewers and media content creator group on Facebook. And it seems every post is about how to get in contact with publishers, how to get a relationship with publishers, how to maintain a relationship with publishers. And that's not your job. It's nice to have a relationship with publishers, and I know publishers, and I'm friends with publishers. But I've also, you know, these publishers who are my friends, I've also slated their games because I felt their games deserve slating. And, you know, hopefully the industry is mature enough to understand that to understand the job of the critic as well as the job of the producer, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've definitely felt bad when I hit the publish button on a review that was negative, but it's for sure. It's never stopped me from doing it because the job of the reviewer is to review, you know, that if that's the role that I've chosen for myself in this community, I got to live up to it and do it right. I I reviewed a friend's game and I slated it. And it's the only time I did, I, the only time I did this, but I sent them an email before saying, hey, my review's coming out on Monday. It's not good. I didn't offer to change it or anything like that. I just felt as a friend, because I knew them personally, I should let them know that, <laughs> that, that what was, because I knew, because they like my work as well. And I think they would have gone tripping to the the podcast feed on the Monday thinking, oh, I can't wait to hear this review. And I know they like my games. And then to hear this, you know, pile on to their game. So I I did that, but I I didn't see how that was a a conflict of interest. It was just, you know, this person's a friend, so I should let them know before it happens. Yes. Although, you know, I think there are differing opinions on this. I think when it's your friend, you have to just be real because you know that they're going to look at it. But, um, you know, I don't feel obligated to tag publishers in reviews that are negative in fact i know for sure don't. Not. i'm not inviting a conversation like i, I said what i had to say <laughs> right maybe that's cowardly i mean what's interesting is you were talking to me about you're thinking about doing previews and tutorials previews no on your channel publish games only for me i uh, see so you oh okay and uh you you felt that as a reviewer, there may be a conflict of interest in that. Have you come to some sort of concord with yourself about it? No, no, I haven't. I'm a purist in the oldest school sense possible. Like I just, I just am. I really have a hard time with the idea of taking money from publishers to produce media that is for people who are deciding whether to buy a game, because I worry that I would taint mm what I am giving to my audience. And that is something that I struggle with. Right. Um, I do think that if I'm making a tutorial, as long as I'm not rating the game and I don't review it, or if I get booked to do a tutorial of a game that I already reviewed, I don't necessarily think that's an issue. But, you know, I think that between full disclosure and also not rating things I've been paid to make content about, you maybe I can find a middle ground there, but I've been hesitating and just sitting on actually doing anything for months because it just bothers me that much. Look, the point is you said it yourself, right? None of us are getting paid by the guardian to produce board game reviews. None of us are being paid by CNN to produce board game reviews. Everyone within this is a, is a, you know, single entity. And so old sort of standards where people were staff writers at papers are going to be different by the very nature of the medium. But I still think you can draw lines and I think lines should be drawn. If you're doing marketing, you need to declare that is what you're doing. And a tutorial for a game, if you've been paid by the publisher, especially if you've been played by the publisher, is marketing. And that's fine as long as you declare it and people are fully fully cognizant that what you're doing is marketing. What I object to is people doing things that is clearly marketing and not being upfront about it. That is, that's unethical, right? Yes. Or somehow saying that, well, you know, I was paid for this, but it's still an honest review. The fact is, even if you, yeah, is it even if you think it is by default, the moment that money changes hands, you are compromised. You are, even if you feel okay with yourself and you can sleep at night, it's, it's just what it is. It's why we have the same rules that we have for, it's why, it's why we should have rules for political campaigns, right? As alighted as those are getting, it's why newspapers have rules or have, should have rules. Even as a teacher, there are rules about gifts that you can accept from parents and students, because 
even if you trust your own integrity, those rules exist for a reason and they should be respected. If, if, you've, if you're being paid to do something by a publisher and you're not declaring that, as far as I'm concerned, you don't have integrity. And, you know, many bad people can sleep at night having done bad things, but that doesn't make the things good, right? Yes. But I'm also just such a ridiculously rule-following person that it causes me physical pain to feel like I'm doing something wrong or dishonest. <laughs> <laughs> so... Well, I mean, being the product of journalists as well, I mean, of course, you're going to naturally have that built into yourself, right? Right. And I also, you know, I teach students. I feel like it is important. If I'm telling you, don't plagiarize, you have to cite your sources. You have to be honest about where you got things. You have to be clear about your thoughts. I think that if I'm sitting there telling generations of children to do this, that it's wrong if I don't do it myself. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I, I think it's just a matter of declaration. I, I, the debate goes on and on, and I don't see how it's a debate. Just declare. De- declare what you're doing. And don't mix up marketing with reviewing, because they're two different things. I think it's also declare what you're doing, but also don't mince words or try to make it sound better than what it is, if that makes sense. Right. I mean, you know, you are or you aren't. You did it or you didn't. You are or you aren't. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Anyway, thank you so much for coming on. So once again, why don't you let everybody know where we can find you and your blunt opinions about games, which is what we're all here for. Yeah, 5 com and youtube.com slash 5 Doomsday, I guess. You guess. Fabulous. And as y'all know, you can find me anywhere as Beyond Solitaire. So please feel free to reach out to me or to Ben. And uh, thanks so much for listening, everybody. Happy gaming. Thank you.